Hello, we are back and we are live for the question and answer session. I would like to welcome Dr. Carl Hart. And I actually applaud for all of us. And I am so excited for the questions that we have here. So if you are just joining us now, during our question and answer session, we start off with question and discussion from our conference participants. And I have a stack of questions from you in the audience and some cyber questions, and we'll move to those. And um, Carl Hart has a question to begin. First of all, I just want to say, oh, damn. Uh, <laughs> I just want to say thank you all for inviting me to this uh, important conference. And I want to let you all know this, I, I, I got the message because if you look at the Nobel, the Nobel, um, uh, the O and the Nobel, um, it looks like that's an Oxycontin. Pill. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So I too like opiates, so I, I, I get it. Thank you all for that. <laughs> no, um, so thank you guys for the presentation, my fellow Columbia uh, uh, faculty members. I have a question related to the model. Uh, when we think about addiction, one of the things that concerns me is people inter uh, use the term interchangeably with drug use, and drug use does not equate to drug addiction. And so when we think about the model of sensitization or even condition place preference, they are not predictive of drug taking in itself. So when you think about the disassociation between sensitization and uh, 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 even condition place preference, what does this mean in terms of human drug taking or even animal d drug taking? What, does, what do the findings mean? I don't think I even understand the question. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. So in, in the, in the and maybe, I, maybe I can address it in simple terms. I think our studies don't concern themselves with addiction per se. We're studying drug use. Yeah. We're trying to explain why there is a tendency for young people to begin taking, to smoke before they go on to harder drugs. And I think we've tried to address that. And the animal model models are pretty successfully. And what I found amazing is that we, poor, ignorant biologists, made a prediction that you could then test in epidemiological data and find support for it. We found that nicotine has to be on board to enhance the effect of cocaine. If you can take nicotine for a year, I'm exaggerating dramatically, stop taking it for six months, then take cocaine, nicotine will have no effect whatsoever, okay? In fact, in the mouse, if you stop taking it for a couple of days, you have no effect. Denise went into the epidemiological data and she found that most people who start cocaine are smoking at the same time. It's not universal, but we're not studying the addictive process. We're studying how kids get involved with drugs. We do believe that if you never take a drug, you're unlikely to become addicted to that drug. If you take that drug, you may not become addicted, but it inc increases the likelihood. Yeah. No, that, that's very helpful, but, but, but it, I, I, because uh, I'm glad you clarified that, because in the, in, the, in the presentation, the term addiction was used, particularly as it relates to learning. Uh, and, and it's that, that may be, I, 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 I use that. That was sloppy on my part, forgive me. <laughs> that's, I meant, that's fine. I meant but, drug use. That's fine. And, and, and nicotine also enhances the effects of alcohol, right? Uh, that's yes. why people... I, I must say that uh, you speak to people who really work full time on the biology of addiction, like Nora Volkoff and Eric Nessler, they do think of it as a graded process, one going into the other. So they would have called this model this learning muscle, an addictive one. But for me, it's unnecessary because Denise's studies relate to drug use. And my model, I follow what she tells me, was based on drug use. No, no, I, I, I agree. I think... I, I want to be happily married, right? Right on, right on. I, I think you're right. I think Nora and Eric may, would think of this as a model of addiction, and that's part of the problem. And, 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 and so I'm glad you, you don't do that. Other panelists want to jump in? Oh, uh, sure, yeah. Uh, okay, so nicotine, fine. Uh, that's a, a very particular drug, and it has a, an effect on a very particular neurotransmitter system, the cholinergic system. And it ha Can you make it louder? Sorry. It, um, the nicotine is a very particular drug, and it affects a very particular neuromodulator system, the cholinergic system, 
you know, isn't the usual suspects like dopamine and stuff are sort of overshadowed by the cholinergic system. Well, so, and, and we also talk about it in lay terms as cognitive enhancement or increased awareness or alertness and all that stuff. So fine, so why wouldn't nicotine enhance whatever you're doing next? And does that really have implications for a gateway hypothesis in general that any, that there is, I mean, is it only about nicotine and whatever comes next? That's my question. My mother warned me I'd be meeting you here. So in preparation for that, yeah. we did another set of experiments. Okay. We looked at alcohol. Uh -huh. We did the same thing with alcohol. We forgot exactly the same results. Okay. Alcohol enhances the effects of cocaine. Cocaine, if anything, depresses the effects of alcohol. Right. But does nicotine have to be the precursor? We speak about alcohol now. Oh, alcohol. We have seen the same thing with alcohol. As the precursor. As a precursor, I just said that. I see. Okay. Alcohol enhances the effects of cocaine. Cocaine has no effect on alcohol whatsoever. Ah, okay. Yes. Interesting. Just finished. We have not yet published those results. We've just finished them. Okay. Well, that's a good answer. So a question that came in on several of these note cards um, has to do with what um, nicotine might be a gateway to what other drugs or what other behaviors that might become addictive. Yeah, and I understand you're talking about We've told nicotine. you everything we know. Everything, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, we want to try marijuana, obviously. Personally, I've never tried it, but you know, it might be fun to try. Uh, but experimentally, I like to try mm -hmm. it. Denise is very eager to do that. <laughs> um, a question that also came up was concerned with nicotine and people who might have been addicted to other drugs and relapsing. Do you have any hypotheses that if you are addicted to something and you are perhaps in recovery and you are still smoking, is, have you looked at all about, we see the pathway, the gateway to other drug use, is there any kind of hypothesis about smoking and... We have no data around that. Denise may have data on that. No, we don't have data on that. Any data on that? Excellent. May I ask a question? Sure, please do. Uh, Denise, given the controversy, you kind of alluded to it in your talk about the controversy in terms of how people have basically bastardized what we, what we mean when we say gateway hypothesis. Uh, we, uh, uh, I know you don't do this, but I, I want to get you to, 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 to maybe comment on this. Um, there are uh, many prominent pro uh, political figures, for example, who would say, Things like, if you use marijuana, you're going to go on to use cocaine right. or heroin, those sorts of things. Um, and they are over-interpreting what you say. Right. And I, if you would, could you well, help us? I, th I think this, this has to be on how the data are interpreted. Because very often what people do is they kind of do the reverse statistic. They say, oh, uh, when people, 100% or 90% of the people who've used cocaine have used marijuana. Therefore, if you use marijuana, 90% of them are going to use cocaine. No, I don't think that. It increases the risk, but it doesn't mean that you're going to engage in the behavior at all. And I think that the, the laboratory work shows in part why this happens. But I, I want to make another point. Very often, people are upset about the, you know, the notion of the gateway hypothesis, and they say, well, it's a completely misspecified model. And really what's happening is that people have a general risk or liability for using drugs, and whatever they use, whether they find they're going to use first, so there's absolutely no so-called gateway effect. And I think that the two positions are not mutually exclusive. I think they're complementary. People may vary in the susceptibility of using drugs to begin with. But once they use a certain drug, uh, it has consequences for their, the risk of using other drugs. And we show mm -hmm. that the direction goes from nicotine to cocaine and not from cocaine to nicotine. Mm -hmm. But what I think actually is particularly interesting in our study, which is completely Denise's idea, is molecular epidemiology of bringing together 
molecular biology with epidemiology and realizing that for certain things, and drug abuse happens to be one, post-traumatic stress disorder happens to be another, you can model it extremely effectively in the mouse. Schizophrenia, depression, very hard to model. Components of it you can model, but the whole disease you can't model. With addiction, or at least drug use, uh, and post-traumatic stress disorder, you can really model it very successfully. And we, my own lab, not with Denise, are looking at post-traumatic stress disorder also. Yeah, but I just want to make a point. It is a reductionist approach. Sure. So you model certain aspects of the behavior. Yes. Right. You don't yeah. model others. But I think one could do better. For instance, you know, peer influence is extremely important as far as drug behavior is concerned. Mm -hmm. But I think you could do experiments in which you have, you know, another Absolutely. mouse, maybe drain, you know, I don't know, but I think there would be ways of modeling peer influence. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are ways of modeling prenatal effects. And, you know, we applied for a grant, for instance, to look at prenatal effects, but we weren't funded, so sometimes you have good ideas, but you can't implement them. Yeah, you know, I, I really like how you're, you're talking about this in terms of right. uh, thinking in a more comprehensive way. Uh, oftentimes when we have these types of discussions, these types of talks, people act as if drug exposure itself, right. it leads to this um, immutable or, uh, or... Progression. Yeah, just exactly. And, and, and when you have people who are exposed to the drug and they go on to become president of the United States, for example. Uh, <laughs> And, and, like, and others, like, like, a little bit of, like a little bit of wine with dinner, which almost every president can't has to have. Right, or if he's going to raise money. Right, right. People have wine for dinner, or they might have an oxycontin because they have to deal with boring receptions or you know things of that nature. Sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, Peg. You, you. No, that's fine. I just want to make sure we give oh, our, yeah, our no, panelists no. opportunity to weigh in here because I'm the referee. Yeah, I was thinking as well about contextual changes. I mean, during the time period that you were talking about, um, and, and let me say that I, I, that I think there's many ways to skin the cat, so to speak, of understanding these processes, and we need to, to implement all of them. But one of the things that came to mind was that during the time that you were, we both have seen a huge reduction in smoking, but we've also seen, at least in terms of up until very recently, a complete change in people's attitudes towards cocaine. I mean, we, it went from a very kind of bougie, one might say, high class, um, uh, associated at least with high class, uh, uh, higher class white people snorting coke, and to African Americans, this was the image, that wasn't exactly who it was, but the image was African American the crack smokers. And I think that was very protective, particularly for white people, of even whether they smoked or not, even using cocaine. So both of those, doing both, looking at the, at the situation from both of those um, perspectives, looking at it from the biological and brain perspective, looking at the, the social context in which all of this is getting played out, um, brings us a lot farther along. The other point I want to make is that in these discussions, the notion of controlled use, or frankly, in any discussion where NIDA fundies are, <laughs> are around, and I'm a NIDA fundee, um, is to, it's politically impossible, right? Um, because of these very reductive sorts of ideas about, about how people use drugs and what happens when they do it. All right. <laughs> We're going to have a really good discussion. Um, like, tomorrow, yeah. I'm going to really get into that. <laughs> it's all you really have to good. come back tomorrow at 10 a.m. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Flanagan. So um, this is a, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm not playing this role primarily throughout, it's not my primary role throughout to talk about 12-step addiction programs at all, because uh, <laughs> I, I go there as patient, not as, uh, but um, I know a lot about them for that reason. So I'm curious if you think your views have any implications for the following sort of problems. So if you go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous right. or Cocaine's Anonymous, all of which I've been to, there are, in fact, a lot of smokers, especially among the older generation. Right. And um, 
and um, there's, no, there's no one discouraging that. Although what there is a lot of, and again, this is a complete amateurish program, it's not run by doctors or anybody, uh, people will take excessive interest in whether or not Carl is taking oxy for his back pain. Or in fact, sometimes there'll be busybodies about, oh, you take, you take antidepressants. They'll say, oops, that could lead you back. So there is a lot of discussion about what could lead you from one place to the next. And, and so this, one nice thing about this work is, of course, um, you'll hear some addicts for, or alcoholics, for example, say, I'm going on the marijuana maintenance program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is a kind of a, a way of you know, getting yourself off uh, alcohol and doing something else. That's generally not approved of, but not, not as far as I know for any scientific reasons. Mm. And if someone sa were to say at an AA or an NA meeting, uh, I think I'll take up smoking, no one would object. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just curious about whether or not you think there are any, uh, does the, these, these cases where we're finding out, as well, both of your research does, that certain drugs will enhance the effects of subsequent use of something else, um, do you have opinions right now about which other kinds of drugs, if you're trying to give up, say, and I'm assuming a voluntary wanting to give up either alcohol or cocaine or heroin, uh, would be dangerous zones to go to? Do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> you I see, would I, say, don't do it. Let me tell you a little bit about the philosophy of science, the way most of my uh, peers think about it. We have a certain body of knowledge, and there's lots of information outside that body of knowledge. My predictive power outside that body of knowledge is as good as yours. This is an unstructured universe. I can speak about the things which I consider reliable, replicated in other people's labs and my own. So there's lots of things we don't know about at all. Right. But certainly, based on the experience we have of cigarettes, there's no question that I would discourage my kids from having cigarettes. And now, my, thank God they didn't, my grandchildren from having cigarettes. I think it's bad for you for many reasons. You know, I smoked for a while. Thank God I gave it up without any difficulty, but I'm so glad I did. Um, but let me tell you what a reductionist approach can do. Um, we have all these so c complicated factors that are involved that it's sometimes difficult to see what are the central themes. A reductionist approach allows you to focus on just a few themes, controlling for everything else, and see what they do. It's not the whole story, but at least it tells you what a part of the story is. Right. Let me tell you something not directly related to this. Sadomasochistic behavior, the most fantastic insight. David Anderson's lab in the last few months, okay? So there's often a question in lots of people's behavior, how come people switch so easily from, you know, love to aggressive behavior? It's a common occurrence. Uh, there is a wonderful painting by Gustav Klimt, the best painting ever made, called Judith and Holofernes. Have you ever seen it? Yes. Okay, so you know the story of Judith and Holofernes. Uh, Judith is a 26-year-old widow living in a small town called Bethlehem, right near Jerusalem. And the Assyrians have put it in a siege, and Holofernes is the leader of the Assyrian army. And after a couple of weeks, the siege is unbearable. So Judith decides she's going to go out and try to do something with Holofernes to save her people. She finds him, he's celebrating. She encourages him to drink a little bit more, he does. She takes him to his tent. They have sex together, exhausted from sex and drink. He falls asleep, and she cuts off her head his head. This has been repeatedly depicted in Western art, this modest widow doing this horrible deed to save her, her people. Not in Klimt. Klimt has her breasts exposed in a postcortal trance, fondling his head. Unbelievable. How does this come into his head? Well, the fact is we now have at least a way of biologically beginning to think about it. There is in the hypothalamus a representation for aggression. There is in the hypothalamus a region for mating, for sexual behavior. These are contiguous regions. There's a 20% overlap. If you stimulate those cells weakly, they're involved in mating. If you stimulate them strongly, they're involved in aggression. So this doesn't explain Judith and Holofernes, but it gives you a way if to begin to think how easily you can flip from one state to an opposite state. 
by simply switching the intensity of signals coming to the hypothalamus. So in the long run, these reductionist approaches, they're just the beginning, and they don't explain Judith and Holofernes, but they give you an early clue as to how things like this might come about. And I think we're going, over the next 50 years, get insight into many of these problems from these kinds of approaches. And I think bridging between gaps, drinking, bridging between clinical aspects of drug abuse, the epidemiological studies of drug abuse, the biological studies is the way to go. I was just worried that you were going to say she, was, she smoked a cigarette and that did it. All right. I'm <laughs> it was an e-cigarette. For, for that, it would probably require pot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, given that you uttered the phrase philosophy of science, um, a question about the use of animal studies and their limitations. Would you talk some about how useful they are and if or where you start to see limitations on them such that we would want to think differently? Okay, now we're talking human beings as opposed to mice. Um, one obvious limitation that any experienced person is aware of is if you develop a drug, you could easily, uh, you could forget about the easily, you can find drugs that are quite effective for animal models of certain disorders. You try them clinically and they often don't work. And this is very disappointing. And so pharmaceutical companies now realize that having a successful animal model in a mouse, for example, is a good beginning, but it's less than halfway there. They need to get either into primates or, if it's safe enough, to somehow do a clinical trial in people on a small scale to see whether it works. So drug development, it's things, number one. Number two, you can obviously see in mice, it's very hard to get a model of depression. Mm -hmm. You can get models of fear, and most of the models of depression are anxiety models, because mice don't show spontaneous depression. Uh, you can express genes that predispose people to schizophrenia. Overexpression of D2 receptor of the striatum does produce schizophrenic-like symptoms, but certain aspects of schizophrenia you can't begin to address in the mouse, because how do you know whether the mouse is deluded or hallucinating? <laughs> you see, with us, exactly. you can tell immediately that I'm hallucinating most of the time, but the mouse, it's hard to tell. <laughs> so there are many things you can't do, but that doesn't mean one needs to do all of them. Mm -hmm. One needs to do it and need to do the limitations. Look, I started off working on the snail, so for me, going to the mouse is a major progression. I still go back <laughs> to the snail, and tackle many problems because it's easy to do it. But then I need to see whether it's also present in the mouse. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Give our panelists another opportunity. Uh, I've got a question uh, specifically about the topic gateway uh, drugs. So I, I really like to see social, um, sociological, subjective you know, uh, research connected with biological research. That's what I try to do too. But the biological story is that a particular substance has to precede another substance in order for the gateway effect to, to emerge. Uh, it can't be reversed. It's not symmetrical that way. Whereas the sociological perspective is very different. Or a social perspective, it doesn't matter what you take first. If you take it and it's fun, you're more likely to take something else. Or if you take it and then you as a result, hang out with a crowd who takes stuff, then you're more likely to take something else. And the order doesn't matter at all. So in this case, the, the biochemical story and the sociological story don't seem to... Uh, you know, I must tell you, I've been listening to you for a long time now. You have a very individual perspective. Yes. She has epidemiological data, a hundred human beings. She doesn't base it on your experience. Your experience and mine can be way off the map. You can't build a science on individual experiences except in very rare cases. Why You've you got to realize... Why, why, why are you taking my comments as, as aggressive or uh, I'm offensive? Sorry? You seem to be taking my comments as trying to, I don't know, uh, fight you. I'm not trying to fight you. I'm just trying to examine something. I'm just trying to tell you that you've got to be careful when you speak to a general audience like this because they don't realize there's a difference between one individual and an epidemiological basis study based on several... Well, That's why you do epidemiology. It's much harder than individual observation. I know. I used to study babies' facial expressions. That takes a lot of time and a lot of work. What? Babies' facial expressions. 
in which you have to, you know, every second of, of, of uh, experience requires an hour of coding. But thanks for the lesson, but no, I think we actually, our individual experiences as scientists are, are important and can be part of the discussion. I, I didn't hear the question, though. Maybe you could repeat it. I think that our individual perspectives and feelings and experiences can matter, even though we're talking about scientific issues. Of course they matter, because we tackle different problems. But ultimately, I should be able to replicate your findings, and you should be able to replicate my findings. Otherwise, it's not science, it's bullshit. Well, um... Uh. I, I think I'd like to yeah, as argue with that. Yeah, just found out, right? I'm sorry? Wait, as the Peg, field of Peg, psychology, hold on. Peg. I mean, I do want to say... I, Peg, I, no I, one told me that I could curse. Well, <laughs> I, do th I, I don't think it's, it's either science or bullshit that okay. what is in between there is vitally important. So as we are here talking about drug use, which is something that individuals do, that we individuals experience the effects of drug use, that we use drugs for certain reasons, that that is part and parcel of what would go into what counts as a good research program for us to undertake to try to understand the development of that, whether there always has to be a sequence, and that good science is objective, but we cannot uh, ignore the fact that scientific questions always arise in a particular context. I, th I, think, we'd have, I think we'd have agreement on that. I mean, that. look so, at the title of the conference, Science and Experience. It's yes, so, and, and the question is, where and how do we include our experiences as we understand, as we disagree, even about what is the phenomenon or what are the phenomena that we are exploring in this conference. So I, for one, would like to make sure that um, invoking Brian Conkle, who yesterday asked that we keep open minds and that we're open to inquiry, that we can maintain that kind of integrity in our endeavors, in our question and answers. So having said that, having said that, um, I would like to ask a question, final question, that came from our audience, and we had this question a few times. It's the question about looking at adolescent smokers and the ways that adolescent brains are developing. They're different from adult brains, and what, if, uh, what thoughts do you have about this gateway you were looking at young teenagers? Do you believe that it functions as the same kind of gateway in adults? Well, it, it's really hard to answer the question because nobody starts smoking after the age of 18. So you're saying, does the onset of smoking have different consequences in adolescence and adulthood? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we have some preliminary data, which is you know, just the beginning. Denise has been interested in this question. She's asked us to look at that. And there is something special about the adolescent, but it's not surprising, mm -hmm. for God's sakes. Uh, that makes them more susceptible to that. Yeah, and I want to add, I mean, within adolescence, of course, you have an age range, and generally you find that the earlier uh, a person gets involved in drugs, right. uh, the greater the likelihood of, you know, all kind of consequences, and generally negative consequences, uh, in terms of future use of other drugs, and mm -hmm. they're becoming addicted, and so on. Right, and that, so that's a very important takeaway message for, for all of us. Age at first use really does matter. So all of our high schoolers out there in the audience, please pay attention to that. And with that, we'll end this session. I'd like you to join me in thanking the Candells and our panelists, and we will reconvene at 3 o'clock. First of all, you made...